Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. There's a lot to cover in today's video, so I'll be quick with the intro. We're going to review game week two, talk about how my team performed. I'm going to show you how my team is currently set up for game week three. We're then going to have a discussion about the captaincy debate because it's a lot less clear this week. Then we're also going to look at my watch list, discuss the potential transfers, discuss the players that I think you should be targeting. So there's a lot to cover. Just quickly before we do jump into the video, for those of you that are new to my channel or don't follow me on social media, just a quick reminder that I have indeed written a book on the psychological aspects of FPL. It's funny with the green screen, the writing goes see-through. The writing actually looks like that. So I've written a book called The Mind Game. It discusses the psychological aspects of FPL, how to optimize our decision making, how to get more enjoyment out of the game and cope with poor decisions, how to find out what your management style is, your strengths, your weaknesses, how you should play the game. So there's a lot covered in it. It's quite a thick book. If you do want to support the channel by ordering a copy, that's absolutely amazing. Or potentially if you just are really interested in it, obviously, which I am, and you want to le learn more about psychology, learn more about yourself and try and get better at FPL, then I would love if you could order a copy. All of the links will be in the description. But without further ado, let's get into today's video. So guys, as I'm always going to do at the start of these videos, just a really, really quick update on the mini league. As you can see, just, just a reminder for those of you that are new to the channel, I am running a charity mini league where I donate the points total in pennies to the top three managers charity of choice. So Sky Girl is number one at the moment. If Sky Girl scores 2,500 points, I will donate £25 to the charity of her choice at the end of the season. And I'll do that for the top three managers. I'm then also donating my points total in pennies to Mind Charity, who deal with mental health, raising awareness, support for those that are suffering from any problems. So I'm very interested in, in supporting charities wherever I can. I'm hoping we can use FPL as a platform to do so. So the code is TTBCQQ. I'll try and remember to leave a link in the comments as well. I'm going to be shutting it in the next couple of weeks, so do join before we end up closing the league. But I just wanted to show you basically who, who the top, I think this is the top 12 at the moment. So you've got Sky Girl and Joe were top one and two last week. Joe and Sky Girl just switched, so Sky Girl's now no, number one, Joe's number two. We've got Liam, Aditya, and I think that's Ferdows making up the top five. So well done if you've got a good score so far. Obviously, all of these guys over 205 points in, in the first two game weeks, which is absolutely crazy, averaging over 100 points per game week. So massive congratulations if you've had a good start, but there's still a long way to go. So you could still potentially get into that top three at the end of the season. So how did I do in game week two? As you can see, Lovely start once again. Game week one went very, very well for me. Scored 109 points, was ranked at around 67k. Game week two was going decently before the Monday night football. I was having an okay game week. I had a red arrow, red arrow down to about 180k. But obviously, come Monday night, the performance from the West Ham boys was actually absolutely brilliant. And that's pushed me up a 5k green arrow to 62k. I'm on around, I'm on 188 points at the moment. So I'm not going to spend too long on this because we've got so much to discuss today, but just a quick walkthrough of how the game week went for me. Sanchez finally getting a clean sheet, obviously didn't do, do, do so in game week one. We know that Sanchez doesn't make many saves. If you've been following my videos in pre-season, I was going th with Backman right up until the deadline, and then I decided to go for Sanchez because I wasn't sure about the Watford defence. But we know that Sanchez isn't going to make a lot of saves. He very, very rarely got save points last season. So six points is pretty much what you're going to expect from him. So I'm happy with that. He's only 4.5 million, not expecting much more from your goalkeeper. The two heroes really are Simakas and Trent. Now, the reason you pick Liverpool fullbacks is you know that a clean sheet likelihood when Van Dijk is back is quite high. And then you're hoping for attacking returns and bonus, which is exactly what we got from Simicast and Trent. So to get 11 and 12 overall from Trent and from Trent and Simicast respectively, that's obviously fantastic. Shaw getting four points is just crazy. We know he makes so. If you're not very familiar with the bonus point system, key passes obviously boost up your baseline bonus points. So Shaw makes a lot of key passes throughout the game, a lot of attempted assists. So he's always very high on the bonus. If he gets a clean sheet or an attacking return of any kind, he's always top for bonus. So he conceded no attacking returns and yet still managed to pick up two bonus points to get four overall. So that's why we have him. His attacking output is absolutely fantastic. And even when he doesn't get attacking returns, he's still very high on bonus points. So I'm relatively happy to keep sure for the time being, but Man United's defense does worry me. I'm not 
convinced that we're going to see many clean sheets over the next few weeks. So if I do need money and attack in the upcoming game weeks to fit in the likes of Lukaku, potentially, um, then Luke Shaw might be the one to downgrade to like a £4 million Livramento or something like that. But we'll discuss that in a minute. The midfield, really disappointed in general. Gundogan was just, in hindsight, a terrible decision. But again, if you've been following my psychology, you've read my book, you'll know we try not to think in hindsight. Was the decision-making process to start with Gundogan sound? Yes, because my decision was, I want to start with Gundogan because I think he's going to start game week one. I think he's going to start game week two. And obviously the game week two fixture against Norwich was fantastic. And I think Man City are going to do well. That was my decision-making process. He started game week one. He started game week two and Man City beat Norwich 5-0. So it was a sound decision. It's just unfortunate that Gundogan didn't get on the score sheet against Norwich. He didn't actually look that threatening, if I'm being honest. So that was probably my only 50-50 decision that I got wrong. But the decision-making process was sound. So I'm very happy with it anyway. I would have gone with Greenwood probably. So that that is a quite a big point swing with Greenwood return, returning 2-2. Two two. Fernandez and Salah. Obviously, after two fantastic hauls in game week one, they blank in game week two. I think the same happened last year as well, because I remember, I think I scored 32 points in game week two last year. So it often happens that the big hitters come out in game week one and smash it and then blank in game week two. Deciding between Salah and Fernandez captaincy, both blanked, but obviously Salah got three points, Fernandez got one. So I guess I got that decision right. But I'm not too worried. F Salah and Fernandez are staying on my team for the time being. And yeah, it's part and parcel of it. They're not going to return every single week. Ben Rama and Antonio are the two that just continue to, to shock me. But I shouldn't be shocked because they're playing so well. that It's not like the underlying statistics don't support the points they're scoring. They're expected to score this many points. They're just linking up so well. And if you watched last week's video, I said it reminds me of Wilson and Fraser from their Bournemouth days. It reminds me of Son and Kane from last year. The link up between the two of them is just amazing. It's not just one of them performing well or them performing well in individually. The, the link up play between the two, they're assisting each other and the other one's scoring. 12 points and 16 points from Antonio is unbelievable. They scored 25 points combined in game week one, 28 points combined in game week two. It obviously sucks if you didn't go with them, and that's a huge point swing, and I don't think anyone expected West Ham to start quite this well. They are continuing to rise in price. Antonio's had two rises. Ben Rama's had two rises. They might then get another rise this week, so I would be tempted to jump on them if you haven't already. The fixtures just continue to be pretty good. They've got Crystal Palace and Southampton in three and four as well, so... I'm delighted that I started with them. Obviously, if you didn't, but you decided to start with someone else, try and think about the decision-making process. Are you happy with the decision you made? If so, then I wouldn't worry too much. Don't try and don't use hindsight bias. Don't think, oh, I should have gone with Antonio and Ben Rama. If you didn't consider them and you pick someone else because of underlying statistics or fixtures, own that decision. Be happy that you made that decision, but you can learn from it in the future. So, Again, but I'm very happy I started with Ben Rama and Antonio. And then the other two, Ings and Wilson. Ings does continue to just not really impress me the way he's been performing the underlying statistics. He looks pretty subpar. The finish was obviously incredible. And that's what we know we get with Danny Ings. He doesn't need any chances. He needs that one chance a game and he'll normally take it. Obviously, brilliant finish. Very, very disappointing that El Ghazi took the penalty and Danny Ings didn't take it off him. After that overhead kick, if you didn't see the goal, it was an overhead kick. After that overhead kick, we thought Ings would take the penalty off of El Ghazi. And he didn't. El Ghazi took the penalty and it was an emphatic penalty as it always is. So it does look like if El Ghazi's on the pitch, unfortunately, Ings isn't going to be on penalties, which is a shame. But eight points after, I think he got seven points in game week one. So two returns in two. I'm very happy with that. But Ings is on the chopping block. I don't want Ings long term. I think I'll probably keep him for this game week, but we'll discuss that in the next section. Callum Wilson, one point is disappointing. He got a yellow card, obviously played 90 minutes as he always does. The... Callum Wilson really should have returned in that game. If you watched it, if you have a look at the data, he was very unlucky not to get a return. So I'm trying to not use outcome bias here. I'm trying to not focus on the fact that he only got one point. I'm trying to instead focus on the fact he got a return in game week one. He does perform very well. His statistics are always fantastic. He's still the talisman for Newcastle. And whilst I don't expect Newcastle to score a ton of goals, with Willock and St. Maxman in the team, I expect them to score more this season. So for the time being, Wilson, I'm happy with. Ings is probably more of a an immediate issue in my team just because the fixtures turn really poor very soon. After game week three, I, I really don't want Ings. So I'd say Ings is the the more immediate worry despite the fact that he has had two returns in the first two game weeks. The bench was very poor again, 1.2 point and two points for Ailing, Cody and Brownhill, but I'm not really too fast. Ailing and Cody's fixtures now turn for the better. 
Luke aiden has got Burnley in game week three. Liverpool in four is not great, but then Leeds fixtures are fantastic. And from game week four, Cody's fixtures are great. So I can either rotate the two of those or I could potentially play both in a four-back formation. So I'm very happy that I own both those players. And yeah, really happy. 79 points in game week two, another green arrow. Approaching that top 50K, staying inside the top 100K, which is a great start. Absolutely delighted. Let's move on to game week three now and preview what my team looks like. So this is how my team currently lines up for game week three. Now, my team value is at 100.8 million, which is great gaining team value pretty quickly. I've not made any transfers, so it's not due to making early moves. I've just been lucky enough to start with a few of the players that have gone up in price, such as Ben Rama and Antonio being the main two, Danny Ings as well. So team value is at 100.8, which is great. Obviously, Sanchez is my only keeper, so I'm going to be starting Sanchez every week until I wildcard. I will be not, unless Sanchez gets injured, I will not be using transfers on my goalkeeper. I just don't think it's worth it. By the time you move your goalkeeper out to someone else that's keep, keeping clean sheets, Sanchez might then go on a run himself. So I'm happy to just stick with Sanchez for the time being. The fixture against Everton isn't great. I don't really expect a clean sheet with the form that Calvert Lewin's in, but it's part and parcel of it. If they do keep a clean sheet, he's probably likely to make more saves than usual with um, Everton being quite a good attacking unit at the moment. The back three I'm really happy with, and this is why I chose the likes of Luke Ayling and Connor Cody, because I knew by the time that Simicast was eventually dropped, then I could then bring at least one of those in. So Luke Ayling against Burnley, I'm really happy with. He might play as part of the back three in that Leeds side for game week three, which means the attack and potential might not quite be there. But at 4.5 million, a clean sheet would be absolutely fine with me. And he can still get forward quite well. Does go up for a few corners too. So still potential there, but probably likely six, six point ceiling. Trent... I'll play Trent every game. Doesn't matter. Playing against City, Chelsea, Liverpool defend well. You never know what's going to happen in these big games and he's got the attacking potential there. So Trent will be in my team. I would never bench Trent. If I was ever looking to bench Trent, I would probably just remove him because it meant I'd lost my confidence in him. Luke Shaw, I wouldn't say he's on thin ice, but I'm not particularly impressed so far with the performances of Shaw and Manchester United in particular. So Wolves away isn't actually a particularly nice fixture. Wolves' underlying data has been fantastic. In game week one, they took 17 shots against Leicester. So Leicester were very lucky to get that clean sheet. Wolves are attacking very, very well. Traore looks absolutely fantastic, um, supporting Jimenez from the left. So I do like the look of Wolves moving forward, which we might discuss later, but I don't necessarily think that's a great chance for a clean sheet, but hopefully you can get some attacking returns and bonus points. You can see I've got Cody first sub. Obviously, against Man United, it's not ideal. My bench is pretty weak for this week, which is the, the main issue I've got. You can see Simicast is third sub at the moment. I just expect him to be dropped for Andy Robertson. Even if he's not dropped for Andy Robertson, I just don't particularly fancy in starting two fullbacks against Liverpool. Simicast doesn't have the same attacking output as Trent, or he doesn't at least have that established nature in the Premier League. So for the time being, Simicast is third sub, but he might move slightly sooner. For the time being, I can't see myself making a transfer in the defence but we will discuss later there is one player on my watch list who I might bring in for Simicas but for the time being I'm really happy with that back three let's move on to the midfield so as per other videos I'm not going to spend too much time talking about Salah and Fernandez for the time being I'm keeping them in my team the reason I did choose Salah and Fernandez, though, is that I said having a second premium makes it a lot easier to get to other premium attackers and that is the case for Romelu Lukaku now I'm personally not looking to bring him in this week. I know he can score against anyone. I know he looked fantastic against Arsenal and I know he is rising in price very soon. So there's a lot of reasons to want to bring him in. I just prefer Fernandes and Salah's fixtures for the next few. I think they're more captainable and they've also been in the teams for a few weeks now. So they've gained that fitness. So I know Lukaku looked great, but for me, I'm going to probably keep Salah and Fernandes at least for the next game week or two and just see how Lukaku looks in the tougher fixture against Liverpool and then maybe against Villa as well. So Lukaku is probably a game week seven or game week eight transfer potentially on my wild card. Salah, I'm obviously not going to captain against Chelsea. I just expect that to be a relatively tight game. He can score against anyone and I wouldn't be surprised if he grabbed a goal or two. But for me, he's not a captaincy option this week. You can see Fernandez is a question mark rather than a captain or vice captain because I just don't know who I'm the captain at this stage. I've got two options I'm deciding between which we'll discuss in the next section. But I'm happy to have Fernandez against Wolves. I'm pretty sure he got a double digit. I think he scored like 17 points against Wolves last season. That might be completely incorrect. But I, I know he's done well against Wolves in the past. I know he can do well against anyone. So I'm happy to have him. I'm also considering him as a captaincy option. He obviously performed really well in game week one and quite poorly in game week two. So it's trying to work out. Is he going to average across the two? Was the game week one a fluke? Was game week two a fluke? This is the difficulty with small sample sizes, but I'm happy with the two of those. 
Ben Rama, I'm obviously delighted with. There's no chance I'm moving him out. So many managers are bringing him in that he might get a double or triple price rise in one game week. He's been brought in by the masses. It was something like four or 500,000 managers in the last few days. So I'm happy to have Ben Rama. He is, I suppose, a captaincy option, but I think there are two better options in my team ahead of Ben Rama. But I'm absolutely delighted to have him against Palace. Gundogan will not be in my team come the end of the game week. That is, well, I say 95% certain that that is where I'm going to use the transfer this week. He didn't perform particularly well in game week one or two. There's no certainty that he will start game week three. And even if he does, I think KDB might start to come back or he might be rotated a little bit with Bernardo Silva and Grealish. So I don't think he'll play the full 90. I'm not convinced that he's making those same runs that he was last season when KDB was out. So for me, and to avoid a second price drop as well, because it looks like it's going to drop again, 7.3. I think Gundogan transfer out is going to likely be where I use at least one of my free transfers. Just worth noting at this stage, I do have two free transfers. Um, I probably don't plan on using both of them. I think I'm going to try and only use one and then carry the second through to after the international break. But that's my midfield. Brownhill on the bench again. I don't ever plan on starting Brownhill unless I, uh, unless he comes on as an auto sub. But I'm fairly happy with the other three players. Gundogan likely to be making his way out of my team this week, though. Just finishing up with the front line. It looks fantastic for this game week. All three of them have shown glimpses that they can score goals early on in the season. Obviously, Antonio more than anyone, but Southampton, Brentford and Crystal Palace, all home fixtures. I genuinely don't think I could have picked a much better front three for this week. I'm really, really interested in Calvert-Lewin. I really want to get him in and he looks like he's going to rise in price again to 8.2 million, which makes it quite difficult to do the Ings to Calvert-Lewin switch in game week four without finding money elsewhere, which I'm going to be able to do, but I obviously don't want to lose too much money making that switch. But I'm not going to take Ings out, I don't think, before Brentford at home. I know Brentford have got two clean sheets. I know they're performing really well. I just still fancy Ings to get on the score sheet in that game. And I'd feel pretty weird taking Ings out after two goals in the first two games before facing Brentford at home. So for the time being, I, I think I'm going to be keeping Ings in. But Ings is definitely going to be one of the players that makes his way out in game week four. Unless something crazy happens in the international break and I have to use my transfers elsewhere. I think Ings to Calvert-Lewin or probably someone like Bankford, but we'll discuss that in a minute. That will be my transfer for game week four. Wilson, I'm really happy with. I know people are transferring Wilson out in the masses at the moment because they're trying to fit in the likes of Calvert-Lewin, Lukaku, Bamford, um, potentially Jimenez as well. So I know people are transferring him out. I'm really happy with his performances in the first two. If you choose a Newcastle striker, you have to accept the fact that Newcastle don't always perform well. They're not going to score a ton of goals, but he is their talisman. He'll score probably 30, 40% of their goals this season. Still on penalties. He still looks fit, doesn't look injured or anything like that. Southampton aren't great defensively. They're, they're going to struggle without Vestergaard in their team. So I'm happy to have Wilson this game week. I'm, there's no way I'm transferring him out before Southampton at home. And Antonio, you can see he's the other one with a question mark next to his name. And that's because after his first two performances, I think he's a genuine captaincy option. I know lots of managers are bringing him in. If I didn't have him, I would probably be bringing him in this week. He just looks fantastic. So I suppose without further ado, we're now going to move on to the captaincy debate. If you own Hyung Min Son, of course, he's a captaincy option as well. But for me, it's between Fernandes and Antonio because they're the two that I own that I think are captaincy options. So let's get into the captaincy debate and discuss who at the moment I am leaning towards captain him. So guys, for this section, this captaincy debate, my camera's off, but you can still hear me. I just, I've made this nice graphic and I don't want my big old bald head covering up half of Antonio and the, the touch map as well. But these are my two choices for captaincy. As I said, if you own Hyung Min Son, by all means, include him in your consideration. But this is my team selection and my captaincy debate that I've got. I genuinely think there might be a bit of bias involved here, but I genuinely think if I had Son as well, it would still be between Bruno and Antonio for me, just because we're not sure if Kane's going to come back in for game week three. We're not sure how much that's going to affect Son going out to the left. Are they going to need a bit of time to get back used to playing with each other? So for the time being, I think it would still be between Fernandes and Antonio, even if I own Son, but by all means do consider Son. So what we've got here on this graphic is we've got the two touch maps for Fernandes and Antonio in game weeks one and game week two. And we've also got their underlying statistics, including projected points and team level XG and opposition XGC. So we're going to go through each of these individually. First of all, if we take a look at the touch maps, of course, the touch maps are going to favor Antonio. Bruno Fernandes is a number 10. He plays in behind the striker, so he's not going to be getting into the box as much as the likes of Antonio, who is a, an out and out number nine. Even that being said, though, Fernandez's touch map is slightly worrying. Even in the first game week when he scored the hat-trick, I think he only had three or four touches in the box. It just so happened that all of them ended up in, in goals. But 
he does drop quite deep. He can be frustrating to only if he's not quite at it, as as was the case against Southampton. He didn't even look remotely like getting any assists or goals. So he normally does bounce back after performances like that. But I... It did worry me slightly seeing how Man United performed against Southampton. Antonio's touch map is lovely. There are some touches deep and on the left when he, he goes out to the left and then Ben Rama or four now goes centrally. But yeah, the, the touch map is significantly better. The first thing I'd like to look at is the players' underlying statistics themselves. So again, these statistics are taken from fantasyfootballfix.com. You can check them out yourself. Link will be in the comments in the description below. Expected FPL points is basically a metric which combines everything. So Everything combined, expected assists, expected goals, touch in the box, chances created, everything combined. Antonio's expected to get 11.4 FPL points per 90 in the first two game weeks. He's expected to get 22.8 points in the first two game weeks. They are absolutely outstanding, remarkable numbers. You, you never see statistics like that. I mean, the highest you would tend to see is around seven, which is what Fernandez has got. Over a season, 6.56, even 5.5 is really fantastic for expected FPL points per 90. That would suggest that if a player plays all the minutes, they're approaching 200 points. So obviously, Antonio's smashed that out of the park. This would be sort of a 400-point season if he were to keep it up, which obviously he probably won't. But expected FPL points, Antonio smashes Fernandez out of the park. Touches in the pot, it touches in the box again, over double Fernandez. He's got 7.8 touches in the box per 90 at Fernandez's three per 90. Again, three touches in the box per 90 for an attacking mid isn't bad by any means, but it's it's not really blowing anyone away. Non-penalty expected goals and expected assist per 90. So this is combining how many goals are expected to score and expected to assist per 90. Antonio at 1.31 again is just remarkable. You very rarely see over about 0.7 across the season and again this is a very small sample size we can't necessarily draw that many conclusions but he's blown Fernandez out the water Fernandez is at 0.73 is still very very good but yeah Antonio again almost double Fernandez team level xg so this is how many goals West Ham and Man United are expected to score per 90 in the first two game weeks so we know Man United struggled against Southampton in game week two but they absolutely trashed Leeds in game week one and yet 1.66 is still nowhere near the 2.79 of West Ham we but we know West Ham absolutely battered Newcastle and Leicester so 2.79 West Ham are performing much better over the first two game weeks than Man United in an attacking sense and then the last one, which is the only one that Fernandez comes out on top against uh, Mikel Antonio, is opposition expected goals conceded. So this is looking at the defensive solidity of Crystal Palace and Wolves in the first two game weeks. So Wolves expect to concede slightly more than Crystal Palace in the first two. However, Wolves obviously faced uh, um, Tottenham and Leicester which are significantly harder fixtures, I think, than Chelsea and Brentford, which Crystal Palace face. So considering how close they are, I would probably say that that would suggest Wolves have the slightly stronger defence, considering the difficulty of fixtures were slightly harder. Obviously, that's open to interpretation. Interpret that however you want. And again, it's a very small sample size and two fixtures. But if we consider that probably a tie, considering how close they are and Wolves' slightly more difficult fixtures, Fernandez isn't coming out on top in any of these statistics. Now, what I would say is Fernandez is definitely on penalties. We're not sure if Antonio is after he's missing game week one. So that's one thing that's in Fernandez's favor. Fernandez also has more historical data with respect to more hauls. We know that he has the potential to haul on a regular basis. Of course, Antonio's got double digits in game week one and two. So he's also demonstrated that himself. So there are a few reasons to captain Fernandez. I, expected his, I expect his effective ownership to be slightly higher as well. But for me, looking at this data, looking at the performances of West Ham in the first two game weeks, at the moment, I am genuinely leaning towards Antonio. I would say I'm probably about 65% in favour of Antonio, 35% Fernandez. So if the game week was right now and the deadline was now and I had to choose, my captaincy would be on Mikel Antonio. But I, I see reasons to captain Fernandez. I see reasons to captain Antonio. I think Sun is a great option as well. So I think in these situations, as again, if you've read my book, you'll know in these situations, I probably suggest just going with your gut feeling because two game weeks of data isn't really enough to draw too many meaningful conclusions. So for me, just go with your gut. If you think Fernandez is going to do well, captain him. If you think Antonio is going to do well, captain him. But in my opinion, Antonio is leading the race at the moment. So the final thing to consider is, well, where am I using my transfers? As I said, I've got two free transfers, but I'm only looking to use one free transfer because I think with the international break, with COVID, with injuries, I've got a feeling 
that two free transfers might not even be enough. And I've got a feeling that we might have three or four players affected by COVID or injuries in the international break. So I'd like to have two free transfers that if I need to make three or four, I'm not, not taking a minus 12, it's only potentially a minus four or minus eight. So I'm very keen to try and only use one, but I'm happy to use two if something happens later in the week. At the moment, these are the players on my watch list. Now, if you don't own Ben Rama, if you don't own the likes of um, Antonio or potentially Fernandez or Salah, then they might be on your watch list as well. But obviously, I own all these players. So these are the players that are on my watch list. And again, if you've got someone like Kane or Vardy in your team already and Lukaku who's an easy player to get into your team, then by all means, include him on your watch list too. But these are the players I'm considering. And I've just put a little star next to the ones that... I'm really considering and if I, again, if I was forced to make the transfer right now, they would be top of my list. So in this little table, what I've got is I've got some statistics from game week one and game week two and expected FPL points, expected goals and assists combined and touches in the box. And then I've also got their fixtures for the next four game weeks, just so that you can get sort of like a visual representation, compare the players that I'm considering across the next few weeks. So the only defender that's on my watch list at the moment is Livramento. Again, I don't really want to make a defensive transfer this right now I don't think there's a need to but Simicast has gone up to 4.2 million so I could potentially sell Simicas for 4.2 there by basically gaining 4.1 million buy Livramento for 4 million and therefore I've banked 0.1 million which would be nice it could potentially come in really handy later on so that's a potential option Livramento does look nailed for the time being but I think with the competition with Carl Walker Peters we can't know for certain but he's on my watch list if I make a defensive transfer it will probably be Simicast to Livramento but I don't think I need to make that transfer this week Saar is another player that's at the top of my list the only reason I'm not definitely going in for Saar right now and I know it shouldn't put me off too much it's very short-minded but I just don't fancy him against Tottenham in game week three Tottenham look really solid defensively Reguilon in particular looks like a very nice option for future game weeks so Saar is up there he's got some really nice statistics he's got after Calvert-Lewin, he's got the most touches in the box out of those in this list. He gets very involved. He's potentially on penalties when Dini isn't on the pitch. But that Tottenham fixture puts me off bringing him in now. I could potentially bring him in slightly later down the line when Watford's fixtures turn for the better. The player that I am highly considering, top of my list, I think I will likely bring him in for Gundogan, is Rafinha. Now, the only thing that was put me off Rafinha was the fact that he might have to quarantine in game week four and game week five. Then yesterday, the Premier League announced that Premier League players wouldn't be allowed to go on international duty to countries that are red listed. And therefore, the players would not have to quarantine in game week four and five. I almost pulled the trigger on Rafinha there and then because I just think he's the best option moving forward. I love the fixtures. His underlying data is always really, really strong. But then... Some of the players started suggesting that they weren't open to this. They they weren't told that the Premier League would have put this in place. They want to go on international duty. Then Bielsa in his press conference said he will do everything he can, everything he can to make sure that Rafinha can go on international duty with Brazil and play all of the matches. So that suggests to me that if the clubs are allowed to choose, potentially Rafinha might be allowed to go on international duty. Therefore, he might have to quarantine in four and five. It's really up in the air. I hope it's just dealt with very soon and we just know for certain. But I'm going to wait potentially today, maybe tomorrow as well. I'll wait as long as I can before deciding to bring in Rafinha because obviously Gundogan might decrease in price in that time and I don't want to lose another 0.1 million particularly. So I'll wait as long as I can before bringing in Rafinha. But if Gundogan looks like he's going to drop in price, which probably be tomorrow evening, then I'll probably have to just take, take the plunge and hope that Rafinha is available for game week four and game week five. I've got the two Spurs boys on there, Ali and Hyung Min Son. If I don't bring them in this week, I probably won't bring them in at all. You'd want them for those game week three and game week four fixtures. So they're on the list. If Rafinha isn't available for game week four, and I don't want to take the plunge on Saar this week, Ali's quite a nice option, but his underlying data is really, really bad. If you take away his penalty, his expected goals and expected assists are zero. He's done nothing in attack. So it would literally just be a gut feeling big punt because the statistics don't back up. Son would require some restructuring of my team. So whilst he's on my watch list, he's not an immediate priority. And then I've basically got the two strikers that I think are going to be must-haves in future game weeks. I think they're going to be fantastic options. Calvert-Lewin and Bamford, both brilliant underlying statistics. Both got brilliant fixtures coming up. Both talismanic figures for their teams. If I was wild carding this week, my front three would be Antonio, of obvious reasons, and Bamford and Calvert-Lewin. I would have those three with a view of trying to get Lukaku in in game week seven. So 
I love both of them. But as I said before, my current three strikers have fantastic fixtures. So I've got no desire to make transfers this week in my striking position. But in game week four, I'll almost definitely be bringing in either Bamford or Calvert-Lewin for Danny Ings. So that's my current watch list. As I said, I think at the moment I'm looking to use one free transfer and it will probably be Ilkay Gundogan out and Rafinha in. So guys, there you have it. That is my Game Week 3 preview team selection captaincy debate video all in one. Please do let me know what you think about this video. It's going to be a lot longer than usual. I don't know what the total length is at this stage, but it's going to be a lot longer than usual. And I've included captaincy and watch list in there amongst the just the game week review and game week preview. So if you like these slightly longer videos where I cover everything, do let me know. I'll continue to do them. If you're saying they're just too long, then, then by all means, just tell me that below and I'll try and make them shorter. I'm going to use the chapter feature so you can skip to the parts that are relevant to you. If you've got a busy day and you only want to see my team or you only want to know what the captaincy decision that I'm going with is, that's absolutely fine as well. If you are liking the content, then please do like, comment, subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications. The channel is continuing to grow at a fantastic rate and I'm just absolutely delighted. I'm loving making these videos. I genuinely enjoy it so much. And I'm enjoying the premiere feature as well where I can chat to you guys live. The next stage will be live streams and I'm going to try and start looking into live streaming and seeing if my laptop and internet is up to live streaming. But I just love being able to interact with you guys. So also drop comments below. I try and reply to every comment. So And if I don't reply, someone else will probably help you as well. Drop any of your potential dilemmas below. I'd love to hear them. I'll catch you in the next video. Obviously, it's the international break next. So next week, there might be one or two other videos. I've not quite decided yet, but there'll be some other things just to fill that gap. And then obviously, the week after that, we'll then be preparing for game week four. And many of us might be wildcarding as well if there's some stuff up in the area during the international break. So I hope you've enjoyed the video. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll catch you in the next one, guys. Thank you very, very much for watching.